I'm here, I think, because when someone gets up and says, I'm hurting, my son's life is devastated, all those, your audience may say, uh, it's their genes. This person was predestined, that, you know, it, it was a birth trauma. You know, it didn't have anything, it's association, not causation. So you have to go back to the science. What does the science say? Do we have evidence that marijuana is a component cause of psychosis or not? And if so, how strong is that evidence? And so let's think about smoking. Smoking, if you had an advertisement for smoking, you wouldn't have the industry there. You'd have a beautiful girl on the beach with a cigarette. Um, 18 years old, who's not got any of the, you know, effects of smoking. She doesn't have lung cancer. Her face isn't wrinkled. Uh, she's not got emphysema. She's not on oxygen. She's not got a toe tag, you know, nothing. She's happy, healthy, and on the beach. So, you know, I don't think that's their method. Their method is to, you know, deceive, basically, I think. Um, but it's important to realize that, the cannabis industry knows that some 80% of the product is consumed by just 20% of the users or less. And in cannabis, we think it's much less. That's true of any addictive substance, 80-20. But with cannabis, like I said, it's less. So what that says, and Bo Kilmer from the Rand Report testified like this to the Senate Finance Committee in, in Vermont. He said, you know, dependence is good for the bottom line, and they're going to support dependence. And I think that statement slowed legalization down in Vermont because the legislators realized that the industry was going to come into Vermont and try to addict as best they can. Well, we know that marijuana is addictive. We know that marijuana is more addictive for youth than it is for older people. Because of that, what we see are things like you know, targeting towards children. The, the, the industry targets towards children because they know that if they can get a youth to, to try it, they're more likely to have a lifelong user and be one of the 20% who's using 80% of their product. So, and, and, and this is, you know, an important part of the psychosis discussion, right? Because um, if you are, have dependency, if you're using cannabis and you experience withdrawal when you stop, if you have adverse, you know, hot life experiences in your job or your family, and you continue to use nevertheless, and you have a use disorder, um, then, then when, when you stop, you will experience sweating, agitation, nervousness, and on day 14, you will experience um, aggression statistically. Now, uh, when, and these are all, you know, descriptions or definitions of addiction. And why that's important to the discussion of, of, of psychosis is that when someone has marijuana-induced psychosis, and if they were to stop, their psychosis would get better, usually. Not always, but usually would get better. Alternatively, if they continue to use, they may, they, may, they may be hospitalized, they may stop using for a short period of time, the fog may lift, but then they may be released and they may relapse. If they continue to use or if they inc increase use, they're more likely to be re-hospitalized, their prognosis is, is worse, and they're more likely to go on to you know, permanent disability, um, full-blown schizophrenia, full diagnosis, and really, you know, many people with schizophrenia cannot do things that um, allow you to survive in the world. You know, you can't pay your mortgage, you can't keep your job. It's difficult to live with other people. You know, it, it is often, you know, folks with schizophrenia many times are homeless. They don't, they, they don't trust the walls. They don't trust the people around them. They need to leave. So, so, so when you have something that's highly addictive and is causing severe mental illness, this is a double whammy. And, and then it's sort of, I guess, what, I might even say a triple whammy when you have add on top of that industry, which is interested in creating addiction so that they can sell 80% of their product.
very little of their product moves for the person who goes on the weekend and tokes for an afternoon or once a month. That wouldn't keep the industry alive. So one thing that I've, when I give my talk at, at the Stanford lab um, on cannabis, I talk about the smoking tobacco and how this is analogous. So how do you prove that something is causal? Um, so we had this problem with smoking. You can't divide a group of kindergartners into two groups cohort controlled, you know, control for poverty or bad life events, adverse, you know, childhood events, and then give half of them marijuana or give half of them nicotine cigarettes and then wait 20, 40 years and see who's dead, right? Who died of cancer or who's uh, schizophrenic. You, you can't do those kinds of studies. And so, because it's unethical. So for smoking, we use the Bradford Hill criteria. And basically, the Bradford Hill criteria looks at a host of different studies. So you might look at longitudinal studies and double-blind prospective studies. So you might look at genetic studies. And when all of these across different you know, places, um, different cultures, different people, different genetics. And so when you look at all of these studies and you, they all point in the same direction, and that's an indication that it's causal as opposed to associative, the, the, the cause and effect. Smoking is not associated with lung cancer. Smoking causes lung cancer. So there are a couple other things that, that people add on to that. If you have a biologic gradient, that means if you take more nicotine, are you more likely to be addicted? Yes. If you have higher levels of THC, are you more likely to develop psychosis? Yes. If you use, you know, more THC over a longer period of time, so will you, are you more likely to, to develop psychosis? Yes. If you have a small study, and they did this at Yale, they did this in the UK, if you have a, a small group of people and you actually divide them into two groups and you give one THC and the other a control and you have some psychotic symptoms, they've done that. Yes. So in the laboratory under control, uh, you know, you do see psychosis. They've done genetic studies. There was a, a recent one that looked at genetic cohorts. So, so they looked at the, um, there are genetic predispositions to schizophrenia. And they found that cannabis is an independent risk factor for psychosis, independent of genetics. So, and that just came out like a few months ago. There are hundreds of studies at this point that are all pointing in the same direction. Cannabis is a component cause of psychosis. It, and, and the more you use for the longer period of time at the more higher concentrations, the more likely, the more risk you are, especially if you're, you know, the younger you are. So... So it's, uh, it's, it's real. The science supports it. Uh, these people aren't making it up. And when it happens, it is devastating. I mean, we do know that uh, in, you know, in, in the United States, we, we, we spend almost 300 and f so just under $350 billion on schizophrenia per year. Um, so that's, you know, hospitalizations and, you know, people with schizophrenia have to be housed and they have to be fed and they have to be, you know, taken care of. So there's support systems, social support systems, and they get hospitalized. So it's in hospital. So, uh, and that's been doubled in the last like nine years, nine or 10 years. So if you take that and you say, well, what percent of that is due to cannabis? And you say, well, you know, between like nine and 20% of people with schizophrenia have actually cannabis-induced psychosis. For young men, it's higher. It's closer to 30. Then you know that between 25 and $100 billion per year is spent on cannabis-induced schizophrenia. That means that money is, you know, if cannabis didn't exist or if we did things to control the development of cannabis addiction, then we would not be spending that money, or we would not have increased it, we would not have doubled it in the last, you know, nine years. I mean, it's unprecedented the levels of THC that have increased. I mean, we know that the tobacco industry increased the nicotine, free-based nicotine, in order to increase the addictiveness of, to of tobacco. And we know 
you know, in, in, in America, what we're seeing now is unprecedented, the, the high levels of THC that people are ingesting and that are available. When you're talking about the Bradford Hill criteria, another piece of the Bradford Hill criteria is you should have a plausible mechanism um, biologic mechanism of, di of disease. And we do. When marijuana THC releases dopamine, and the release of dopamine is also associated with schizophrenia. And antipsychotics, which control schizophrenia, which control people's uh, auditory and visual hallucinations and disorganized uh, thinking and speech, is used to treat schizophrenia. So we satisfy the Bradford Hill criteria, basically. I think in the world today, there's the feeling that marijuana is not addictive. You hear that a lot. Marijuana is not addictive. You know, I, I, it's not addictive. Um, but if we do the studies, we look at, you know, what happens when you stop marijuana, people become jittery, nervous, they lose their appetite, they can't sleep, and they become aggressive. They've actually done science around this, really beautiful studies. Um, and what they find is that cannabis uh, logs onto the receptor um, in a very tight way. So we have a, a hormone known as anandamide, which is released, which it looks like THC, but it's natural, and it, re it has the same effect as THC, but less, and it goes away quickly. But when you have the THC, the plant lodged in there, into the receptor, it's, it's, um, it's sticky, so it stays there. So more can't so you have to take in more in order to feel the same effect. And at some point, all of your THC receptors are full of sticky plant THC, and they can't be, um, they, they can't dislodge and then start again. And then eventually, those receptors will fall into the cell. And it takes a full month for the cell to rebuild receptors and display them on the surface, which is why it makes sense that it's about a month of withdrawal symptoms for people before they start to feel okay again. I mean, depending on how much they're taking and at what frequency and whatnot. But I just think that's a very nice visual to kind of think about. There's a new study that came out not too long ago, and it's looking at the addictiveness of cannabis versus alcohol, uh, smoking, cigarettes, and opiates. And they looked at the kids 13 to 17. And when they were exposed to THC three years later, what percent of those people who were exposed originally three years later, what percent have a use disorder, have an addiction to cigarettes, alcohol, um, opiates, or cannabis? With the other three substances, opiates, alcohol, tobacco, the addiction rate for those kids is about 10%. It's 11, 9, and 11 percent. With the cannabis, well, if they're exposed between the ages of 13 and 17, follow those kids for um, three years. At the end of three years, test them, see if they have use disorder. 20 percent have a use disorder. So what this says to me is it's, it's actually a very addictive substance. And then we have someone uh, at the University of Vermont who's doing really fantastic research. Um, Dr. Alan Butney is a researcher, and he treats especially youth. And he has looked at uh, trying to figure out how best to treat our youth for marijuana um, addiction or use disorder. And he says that if you, in his studies, if you give these folks state-of-the-art treatment, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, motivational, th whatever. And then at the end of the treatment, you follow them for a year. At the end of a year, only 10% of those kids are still abstinent. So if you have a disease that's as devastating as cannabis-induced psychosis slash schizophrenia that develops, and you have something that's as addictive as cannabis, whereas 20% of the kids that try are going to end up having a use disorder, and only 10% of those kids who undergo state-of-the-art treatment and complete it will be abstinent at the, age, at the end of, of a year, it's a, it's a very sobering set of data points in terms of trying to get a handle on, on psychosis, on, on cannabis-induced psychosis. Um, and it kind of brings me to um, um, what, what, what can we do? It's very addictive. It's a devastating disease. It's horrible if it develops. The kids don't stop. It's very difficult to treat. What do you do? And 
The answer is prevention. In Iceland, they've done a beautiful job. They've exported their model out. But basically, it's a very simple model. You take a community on a small level, and you say, what in this community uh, is, is a risk factor? You use surveys to identify risk factors and, and protective factors. So you have two things, things that are protecting the kids and then things that are risky for the kids. So ec more shops might be risky. High THC might be risky. Time spent with parents might be protective. And you do things in your community to increase your protective factors and decrease your risk factors. If you do that year after year after year, the Icelandic model shows that they had a terrible problem. They had the highest use rates in all of Europe. And 10 years later, they were in near the bottom. And then they just kept falling. We have a model. We know what works. We can do this if we you know, choose to. And it's, it's, um, it's exciting, if you think about it. It's w about what's possible um, and the choices that we make. So for example, another thing, in, in Ireland, marijuana is illegal right now, I think. Um, but they were worried about it. They had a proliferation of head shops. And um, uh, the psychiatrists were worried about the proliferation of head, head shops. Uh, Bobby Smith was the leader of this, this research group. And uh, they looked at the admissions for psychosis. And as the, as the head shops proliferated, the psychosis admissions increased like 20%. So then they were able to get through to the powers that be to shut these shops. It was still illegal there. And so they did. And they shut and passed a rule and shut the shops. And their psychosis admission rates to the hospitals decreased 20%. It's a beautiful study. Um, and, and, and really, you see that recapitulated. The studies coming out of out of uh, Canada, if you look at cannabis-associated schizophrenia in Canada, has tripled since they legalized commercialized marijuana in Canada. Um, the admission rates in the ERs, you know, have gone straight up. So, in and in Iceland, you know, if you the, in in contrast, their admissions for drug abuse, drug you know, drug treatment has gone in half for young men. I mean, that's amazing. And the, the savings, the savings just in treatment is big. But think about the savings in terms of those, those kids' lives and their families' lives and the communities that then benefit from all of their abilities and ability to participate and contribute to their environment.